Welcome to the Unspeakable Podcast. I'm your host, Megan Daum. My guest is evolutionary psychologist Diana Fleischman. Diana's areas of research include human sexuality, the effect of hormones on behavior, and how disgust, that is, the condition of being disgusted, is an evolutionary adaptation, especially for women. For nearly a decade, she was a lecturer at the University of Portsmouth in England, and today Diana is a bit of a dissident academic. She's not affiliated with any institution, and she's going to talk about why that is, as well as why the field of evolutionary psychology is so often maligned, misunderstood, and misapplied. We go deep into the relationship between female social hierarchies and cancel culture. I ask a question I frequently ask, and that is whether cancel culture, however defined, is actually run by women. She has some interesting things to say about that. And if that's not enough, about halfway through, we get into a deep discussion about polyamory, what it really means, what it takes to make it work, and why most people just don't have the emotional discipline to succeed at it. Sorry to break it to you. For the bonus portion for paying subscribers, Diana stays overtime and talks about how her younger self would feel about her current self, why she's a transhumanist, and why she donated her eggs several years ago and wrote letters to her future genetic offspring. If you're not yet a paying subscriber, you're going to want to become one right now. So go to megandown.substack.com. And in the meantime, here is the main part of my conversation with Diana Fleischman. Diana Fleischman, welcome to The Unspeakable. Hey, thanks for having me. I want to talk about lots of things. I want to talk about your field, evolutionary psychology, and why it's routinely dismissed by people who tend to see it only as it's abused in pop psychology and in the manosphere. Uh, I want to talk about your feelings about the Me Too movement, about this new emerging conversation, also about the sexual revolution and some of its unintended consequences. Mm -hmm. I want to talk about polyamory. But I think I'm going to start by asking you a big question about human evolution. And that is this. Where do you think we are right now as a civilization? Are, are we advancing? Are, are we getting better? Or have we taken this whole project about as far as it can go? That's a very big question. Um, yes. Just get I it think, out of the way. <laughs> I Yeah, there there are certainly people who are routinely attacked for talking about something called dysgenic pressures. So one idea is that people who are uneducated or have otherwise, you know, poor self-control or who are low in intelligence, I just don't, we might as well get out of the way that people differ in quality. That is a thing I believe, and it's a very controversial foundation of, of many other opinions, but people do differ in quality. And there's this one idea that, that that's the case. Uh, there's this other phenomenon called the Flynn effect, which means that people are getting smarter, most likely because of better nutrition and uh, better health care, the rise of um, antibiotics and the ability to treat infections that would have made us dumber uh, and have various different psychological problems. So it's a very tricky question. Many people think that we've gotten to the apex of where we can, uh, given healthcare and, and other different civilizational technologies. Uh, some people think that we are on the up and up and technological augmentation is going to improve humanity even further. Given the backlash that I've seen to various things like genetic technology, things like embryo screening, well, I think individuals are going to use those things and that it's going to happen that wealthy people use those technologies to try to make their, their offspring better. Uh, people are going to routinely have IVF so that they can choose the smartest embryo, so they can have the best child that they can um, among a batch of embryos. I think that that's going to be very commonplace in, in 10 years. But uh, that's, that's I think, going to be an improvement just for a small sector of the population. And who knows what the backlash against that kind of thing will be, because uh, as we know, humans are allergic to inequality. Mm. Well, Americans are anyway. So what was that concept that you said right at the beginning there? Was that like... Dysgenics. Dis okay, but is that like the idea that the is this sort of like the opening of idiocracy? Like the people yeah. who are who are procreating are the, are the stupidest people. Explain that more. Yeah, dysgenics is the idea that well, that people who th this is just the, the case is, is is true that people who have difficulty 
uh, planning their fertility are the people who are most likely to accidentally get pregnant. And if you have trouble planning your fertility, it might mean that you have difficulty with other forms of self-control or intelligence or planning or forward thinking, other frontal lobe kind of stuff. And an idea that has been propagated by various people who are also very controversial, like Charles Murray, is that welfare incentivizes people to plan ahead even less. I'm a little bit skeptical of that. Even if you look at people like, you know, in the UK, for example, there's all this controversy about boats, about people coming over from Africa, North Africa. Uh, and what they what they keep talking about is, oh, we're going to send back the boats or we're going to clamp down on immigration. And then if you actually ask migrants, okay, why did you come over? They'll say, well, my cousin's here and he's got a good job. It's not like these people are thinking, okay, what is the current UK policy and how is it going to affect me? They think in terms of who do I know in the UK who's having a good life and how do I think that I can make that happen for myself? And they're myself? planning ahead. That's pretty forward that's a, thinking. That's a, that's a planning ahead. That's Certainly, they're not going to use big data. They're going to use the anecdotal evidence of the people that they know. And that's actually a, a much more human way to make uh, decisions. But it's not the way that highly educated people tend to make decisions. So what what is interesting is that the upper class is imposing how they would make a decision. If I was a migrant and I was thinking about coming over on a boat and nearly drowning, uh, what would I think about? Would I would I go and go on the you know BBC and look for the current immigration policy? Yeah, you might do that, but most of these people are just talking to their cousins with SIM cards. Okay, and when you when we talk about people who are not planning ahead or not sort of organizing their lives maybe as well as they could, being more likely to uh, procreate historically, is that more pronounced now because we have birth control? Like the phenomenon that you just described, does that really only apply in modern times because we can control our fertility at all? Yes, I think that's the case. Yeah. And, you know, previously, there are people who like to point this out. I don't know what the evidence is, but that that birth rates were falling even before the pill uh, came around, that people had some idea of uh, how to control their fertility. I just wanted to say as an aside, Great job, Megan, getting me to say almost all the most controversial things, I think, within the first five minutes of this. Yeah, podcast. I think we've covered everything, so I'm going to let you go in a minute. <laughs> but uh, yeah, the, that that people were able to do that, um, that women especially had some some inkling about about this. But you know, there's, a, there's an interesting conversation about the phenomenon of abortion. So Donahue and Levitt are this couple of researchers and famously in Freakonomics, they posited that abortion has lowered the crime rate. Right. Right. right? And uh, Michael Hobbs did an incredibly disingenuous take on this in his, If Books Could Kill, which I listened to. He Wait, did this not is mention. Michael Hobbs, the, the journalist? And yeah. Are you talking about Michael his Hobbs, podcast? Michael Hobbs, the journalist. Yeah, yeah. So his okay. podcast, If Books Could Kill, he'd covered this issue. What he didn't cover is that there's a 2022 paper that uses 17 more years of data showing that the difference in legalization of abortion also has this effect on crime rates in the last 17 years. So it wasn't just in the 90s. It's also perpetuated uh, till now. And certainly people say stuff like, oh, you can't use whatever data analysis method they used. It doesn't matter what data analysis method they used if you disagree with it or you agree with it. Nobody else has been able to describe this phenomenon. Lead is the other big one. And they even had, you know, if you listen to the podcast with, with, uh, on Freakonomics, uh, there are lead experts who say lead is a contributing factor, but the abortion factor is, is a bigger factor. Anyway, the, 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 that idea is that legalized abortion is, in fact, eugenic in that it prevents people who are more likely to be criminals from existing. And they said something like, I think what their stat was, 400,000 abortions means like 10,000 fewer homicides or something like that. I don't know if I have the numbers exactly right, but they don't ascribe it to any genetic causes because the paper is already spicy enough. They don't want to do that. So they say they ascribe it to something they call unwantedness. If you were unwanted as a child, then your parents treat you differently than if you were wanted. Mm. And if you were unwanted, you are more likely to have environmental factors that contribute to, to criminality. Um, you know, it's interesting because what we would expect is that sort of conservatives and progressives would 
well, they do in some extent come to come together on this issue. Although progressives would never put, they would never say people who are unwanted are more likely to be criminals. They, they don't think they'd, they'd say it exactly like that. It's true that if you whether or not you believe it's environmental factors or genetic factors that contribute to criminality or or both, either way, people who have unplanned pregnancies are going to be more likely to have children who end up being criminals. Hmm. Okay. Because we don't have to go too far down this <laughs> on this particular topic, but my understanding was that the majority of women who have abortions are married and already have children. Or, or at least already have a bunch of children, like this cliche that it's like, you know, a young woman who's just having abortions as a way of, that that's her form of birth control kind of thing. That's It doesn't have to be the majority of women who are, you know, married and already have children to be having abortions for abortion to have a big impact also on people who are unmarried or have unplanned pregnancies. I don't think, I, I care, there's different ways of, sl- of slicing this data, but as far as I know, uh, yeah, it's it's totally possible that some people are using it as a as a final uh, form of birth control. Even so, it would mean that they they'd be having one fewer child. Okay. All right. Well, let's as if uh, the last few minutes hasn't answered this question. Let's talk about what kind of researcher you are, why you are not working in academia affiliated with a a major university at the moment, sort of how have you positioned yourself as as a researcher, as an evolutionary psychologist? So you are, you know, very much in this kind of heterodox space, what we were calling the intellectual dark web for a while. I I Mm. don't like that term and I I don't think you've ever really officially aligned yourself with that, but sort of, you know, how do you feel about the kind of relationship to your own ideas and thinking and the outside world in terms of its receptivity to your ideas? I'll just go through a little little brief biography. So I did an undergraduate year at the London School of Economics. I learned about evolutionary psychology. I was just a quivering puddle of excitement every time I went to evolutionary psychology seminar. <laughs> And so I became kind of obsessed with it. That was also when I read my husband's, my now husband's book for the first time when I was like 20 years old. Oh, when that's I was romantic. At the School of Economics. You say, I, someday well, I'm going to marry this guy. He, he groomed me with his words. <laughs> so, Uh-oh. He's a groomer. <laughs> a groomer. So when I met him a few years later, I was very excited to meet him. It just took, you know, several years of stalking. Uh, to marry him. But anyway. <laughs> so, you can write a dating guide next. We're, we're going to get to this. Okay. Uh, yeah. And then I, I did I did a, a PhD in evolutionary psychology with David Buss. I finished my PhD right as this financial crisis was happening. So about half the jobs that I applied to froze their searches. It's very hard to get a job as an evolutionary psychologist. Uh, if you actually, there was just the How Human Behavior and Evolution Society conference. And my, my husband was remarking that the society has actually stayed the same size for like the past 10 or 15 years. It's like been 400 people. It's going to stay 400 people. It's, uh, you know, this, this is this group. Uh, because you usually have to get another kind of specialization in order to get a job. So I worked in health psychology on a menopause study and also on a hand-washing kind of public health study. And I was able to market myself as a, as a health researcher as well. And I got a job at the University of Portsmouth where I was for the better part of a decade. I didn't leave academia because of any kind of censoriousness. I left academia because it was impossible for me and my husband, we were long distance for something like five years, to get a job in the same place. I felt comfortable saying whatever I wanted to say at my university they were very relaxed. You know, I was even on some late night program telling dirty jokes and they thought it was funny. And that, that link was shared around my, my colleagues. I don't, I wasn't like popular among my colleagues because I was weird in many ways that they didn't quite understand, but I did like them and they liked me and they didn't bother me. And I, I got to teach what I wanted and I, I got to research what I wanted. I wasn't doing anything spicy at that time. I was interested in immune, you know, immune parameters and uh, disgust, sensitivity and stuff like that. So I ended up leaving my job uh, to move to the U.S. so that I could get married and have children because I was getting into my late 30s. And I thought, you know, I liked my job, but I just didn't think it was going to be the be-all, end-all of my life uh, at that time. And now I'm writing a book and I work for a magazine called Aporia doing interviews with 
heterodox people. And I also uh, do some writing and I take care of one small child and soon to be two small children. Yeah. Okay. So how do you sort of defend your field against all this kind of junk science that we see? I mean, you know, the the concept of the just so story, that's the sort of derision that's applied to Evo psych, the way, you know, every single kind of human behavior can be explained or excused because you can boil it down to biological imperative. So what, what's your, what, what's the case for yourself and your field? Evolutionary psychology has some incredibly rigorous researchers, people who literally go to hunter-gather societies and, you know, take their blood and look at their immune parameters and count how many children they have and trace paternity. And then it, because it's quite an intuitive field and it marries some of the greatest insights of the last hundred years, you know, evolution, economics, cost benefit, trade-offs, all these different things that we rationally think about. It's often embraced by the manosphere red pill people. I watched this guy on YouTube the other day talking about day game, like talking about, you know, having sex with, I guess, two or three women a day that he picked day up. Day game? I've never heard day that game. term. Oh, day game is like, uh, if you look at red pill guys, they talk about day game, like picking up a woman to have sex with in the day as opposed to at night in a bar. <laughs> so that's kind of like a stat, like do you get more points because it's during the day and like you're not drunk? Or- yeah, yeah, yeah. Because women are like less uninhibited. Uh, they're more inhib- you know, more uninhibited at night when they're drinking. You know, to 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 get somebody to hop on your dick in the cold light of day is pretty difficult to do. And so he talked. Sounds appealing. Yeah, you know, some people like it. <laughs> so uh, um, talked about having a woman with him as social proof and about how women copy each other. So taking some insight from evolutionary psychology, and I know some of the people who've done work on this, and applying it to to getting laid. So that's the kind of distasteful stuff that people dislike. Uh, skeevy guys y- using evolutionary psychology to explain away their bad behavior or to have sex in a way that people find repugnant. But it doesn't, you know, that all casts a, a pall on, on evolutionary psychology. And there's certainly varying levels of, of rigor, but there's even a lot of stuff that I think, you know, can't be proven, you know, empirically that makes sense and, you know, where, where, the, where the results, you know, just, just how you think about it. You know, my book is not going to be especially rigorous in terms of citing sources. There's just a lot of stuff that, that makes sense to me. So, for example, women tend to be more emotionally jealous than men, very well substantiated by data. It's called emotional jealousy versus sexual jealousy. Because for Oh, women, I was going to say, because that's surprising because men seem much more jealous than than women, but it's a different form. Well, the the long story short of it is is that, you know, a woman who's emotionally jealous, she's worried about her resources, you know, what she's getting from a man in a committed relationship being diverted to somebody else that, you know, she's going to lose out. And that was a life or death kind of proposition for many women who relied upon men for protection and for resources throughout evolutionary history. But it can be desensitized. You can, over time, come to the realization that somebody, even if they go out and they come back, that they always come back to you, that that they show you similar levels of love and care. And women throughout evolutionary history often shared a man. There's this joke. I can't remember who came up with it. It's like, would you rather be the third wife of JFK or the only wife of Bozo the Clown? Women had (laughs) this choice about whether they wanted to share a high-value man or or have a low-value man all to themselves. Mostly high-value men had the option because 80% of societies have been uh, polygynous. Whereas for men, you know, desensitizing jealousy is much more difficult. You can have this impression that your wife is chaste and that she's, you know, exhibiting fidelity and that she's not having sex with other people. But l- literally any five minutes she's out of your sight, you know, in terms of the evolutionary risks of it are, are a risk. And there's also some evidence that in societies where men are supposed to take better care of children, they also exhibit more jealousy. If you're not expected to do anything when children are born, other than, you know, hang out with them sometimes, then what do you care if she has other people's babies? It's really when men are expected to heavily invest that they also want those children uh, to be genetically related to them. So can I prove with data that 
women are more easily desensitized to jealousy. Yeah, I mean, I guess it's possible. I have thought about different designs. I'm not, I don't feel like a strong, you know, because I'm writing for a popular audience. And for many people, that seems like a, a reasonable thing. Many people resonate with this idea that, oh, you know, yeah, I have become desensitized to emotional jealousy or it's, it is difficult to become desensitized to sexual jealousy in a way that it's not with emotional jealousy. So some of these things will be not proven, but have evidence for them or against them. But it doesn't mean that those things are, are, not, are not useful. And, and you know, our, not, not to get into what about isn't, but there's so many just so stories that float around in the culture that people don't question at all, like intergenerational trauma or transgenerational trauma. This very popular idea that somehow, I don't know, your great-great-grandmother who was a slave is causing you to, you know, do badly on the SATs or whatever. Super popular. Total. Yeah. And it's fine. Uh, you know, Kate Mann, who came up with this idea of empathy. Oh. Yeah. Wait, empathy. Okay, but yeah, explain what that means. Is this similar? Society sympathy for high status men who get accused of bad behavior. Oh, okay, sorry. This is a separate concept from epigenetic yeah. trauma. Okay. But, you know, the the evidence actually points to the idea that people are more sensitive to women's suffering and pain than men's suffering or pain. Right. And so, you know, but people like that idea because they see high status men, I don't know, Johnny Depp or whoever, uh have gotten public uh, condolences or or sympathy. So, Data often doesn't actually touch these these popular kind of justice stories that are uh, floating around in society. Anyway, uh, but yeah, d- you know, evolutionary psychology is very popular among a huge number of unsavory people, and it is used to justify or validate many different unsavory ideas. And that's always going to be unpopular, but it doesn't make it wrong. <laughs> you started coming into my awareness. Probably around the Me Too movement, I was really interested in the way you were talking about how women exert their power, the problem with infantilizing women, the idea of toxic femininity. I actually wrote a piece, I think it was in 2018, about the concept of toxic femininity. I thought if if we're going to talk about toxic masculinity all the time, which I don't think we should because I hate that phrase, but okay, <laughs> if we're going to do that, then we have to acknowledge that women are just as capable, if not more so, than of doing untold damage <laughs> to psychologically, psychologically doing reputational damage. Men, you know, may fight with their fists, but women engage in a psychological warfare that is arguably much more destructive. So, I, I wonder what your thoughts are about that. Like, let's let's start sort of parsing all of that. Yeah, men have terrible things that they do. They have ways that they impose suffering and damage on other people that is you know, more unique to them. And women have ways that they impose suffering and, and damage on other people that's that's unique to them. I, I wrote this piece for Pirate Wire is about women's uh, friendship and the ways that women relate to each other. That That's even a bit exotic to me because I am mostly friends with sort of rationalist, aspie women. And so this... <laughs> unfeminine women, yes. Unfeminine women. Yeah, women who don't see why there's... You know, some of these women are really strange feminists because they actually don't see the difference between themselves and men because they are very similar to men mm-hmm. in the way that they they relate. But yeah, if if you were to talk about toxic femininity, I guess I'll, I'll uh, float this idea that I haven't written about but is brewing and, and I will write about at some point. Uh, there's a, a personality disorder. It's called borderline personality disorder. And borderline personality disorder is called that because it was considered to be right at the cusp of a personality disorder and a, a you know, full-blown mental illness because it causes so much damage. Oh, that's why it's called borderline? I never knew that was where that came from. Okay. thought it was from the Madonna song. <laughs> but... Uh, uh, borderline personality disorder, people who have it, and they're they're mostly women, are are very sensitive to cues of abandonment. They can vacillate very quickly between being very punitive and very adoring. Uh, they can be uh, impulsive, highly sexed, self damaging. And I've had several 
or few female friends who had uh, borderline personality disorder of different kinds. And uh, way more women have it than, than men. I think it's sort of the, you know, maybe if you want to talk about men being oppositional or defiant or having psychopathy, I think is apex of toxic masculinity. I think borderline personality disorder is the apex of, of toxic femininity. And these people do, do cause a huge amount of damage, you know, these women in general, uh, because they're extremely uh, vindictive and vengeful and punitive in various different emotional ways. So it's not something that people necessarily uh, talk about very much because, you know, with Me Too, what what's happened is that a lot of women who have borderline personality disorder who are interested in absolutely skewering the reputation of men who wronged them in some way, whether that was a big wrong or a, a small wrong, have become champions of the feminist movement. Not necessarily because they were taking down bad actors, but I think that the whole point of Me Too was to vilify men in power so that women could take their places. It was a, it was more revolutionary than it was justice-based. It was more about uh, replacing men with women than it was replacing bad men with other people. Really? You really think that? That's a, I think that's the, quite the, an assertion. The, the goal in the end. I mean, you know, if you look about people like... I mean, I know some people who have been me too, but people like Garrison Keillor, who was having a totally consensual relationship. Yeah, I, I I can't remember what this guy's name is. This ITV presenter, his name is Schofield. I haven't really kept up with it, but I would just like for everybody to stop concerning themselves with who is having sex with whom. Just don't worry about it. If somebody's like 40 years older or 40 years younger, it doesn't fucking matter. <laughs> If somebody is a good presenter, that's fine. But this has been there's been so much turmoil uh, over how people manage their romantic and sexual affairs that I really think is immaterial. And it's because we've all decided for some reason uh, that who people engage with sexually and romantically can cause just pervasive damage uh, when it can cause pervasive damage to very sensitive people, but it's it's not on the whole. Uh, necessarily a uh, bad thing. I remember I had a student a uh, couple years ago. I mean, it was, it was not a couple of years ago, 2017. So right in the middle of the Me Too movement. And we were talking about the definition of gaslighting. People are saying, well, what does that mean? What does that mean? And this young woman said, oh yeah, that's that thing that men do to women. <laughs> <laughs> and I thought, wow, you're really not giving yourself enough credit. Like it, women are the masters of gaslighting. Like nobody does it better than 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 we do. <laughs> nobody so, gaslights you better than you gaslight yourself. Right. That's true. That's true. Uh, sort of self immolation. But yeah, like <laughs> I wonder, like how you feel about the way that I don't know if if this is where we start talking about the women's movement and how this kind of, you know, we ran into this paradox where we're, we're talking about empowering women and, you know, elevating women and making sure that we have advantages and there's an equal playing field. But so much of the, that effort was kind of rooted in a baseline assumption that women were inherently less capable or needed special protections I mean, we do need special protections in some ways, but this idea that a lot of feminists or, you know, sort of new feminists talk about the infantilization that was going on, um, just kind of in the context of progress and the, in the name of progress. And it's very, it's very contradictory. Yeah. I think, you know, women are uniquely sensitive in some ways. It's difficult to wrap your head around the ways that women are sensitive in ways that are different than men without grappling with evolutionary thinking. So that's one reason why I, I appreciate Louise Perry and Louise Perry's book is because she talks about why women are uniquely harmed uh, by by some things like surrogacy or sex work or doing pornography. Uh, I myself wouldn't make any special concessions for those harms because I think allowing people to make decisions that enable them to harm themselves or help themselves is more important than preventing harm. And we should say this is this is Louise Perry's book The Case Against the Sexual Revolution. She's been on this on this podcast, but yes, that's what we're talking about. Yeah, 
so she, so she, you know, she thinks that women are, are harmed in these unique ways. If you don't grapple with evolutionary theory, then you need a whole lot of explanations about how society socializes women to be more agreeable and about how society socializes women to feel more shame. And people on the left or progressives tend not to agree with the evidence-based assertion that women are more neurotic than men. That is, that's the biggest difference in personality between men and women. Women are more likely to feel that they've been harmed. They're more likely to have negative assessment of an ambiguous act committed against them. Hmm. And they're, they're, they're more, I mean, uh, not, not to toot my own horn here, but I'm incredibly no, low on neuroticism, so it's not necessarily something that I, I strongly identify with, but I'm related to many people who are very high on neuroticism, and I do know how to you know, navigate relationships with people who, who experience ambiguous interactions as negative or even, even positive interactions as negative, but that is a, a definitely more feminine uh, characteristic. Yeah, and actually, I want to understand what neuroticism means, because I think people get hung up on that, because it's a, it's a loaded word. We talk about people being neurotic, but it's, it's actually like, it's a, there's a specific definition. I mean, it's, is it a, like a clinical term? I don't know how you would characterize it's a, it. Like it's a it's, personality characteristic. Right. And it's it's a it's a bunch of different stuff together. You know, some of which are can be teased apart. Some people have one aspect of it, but not another. But it involves uh being anxious, ruminating about th- bad things that have happened to you, or ruminating about things that are possible to happen that are bad in the future. It involves the interpretation of interactions with other people, such that you interpret it that some kind of ambiguous interaction as uh, negative. I think one one thing everybody I can identify with is this sort of treadmill that's happened, where if you just send somebody a text message with a, a period at the end of it and like no emojis, then they're going to think that you want to you're like going to come over and slit their throat. Like you can't just do that anymore. Oh my god! <laughs> or or if you don't have an exclamation point, like when did the exclamation point become this mandatory thing? It's like if you don't have an exclamation point, you're being really serious. Yeah, you have to. You, yeah, the, the the text message thing is, I think, really been driven by uh, by neuroticism by so, women. Yeah. Well, and okay, uh, sorry, not to dwell on this, but like the emo- I hate emojis <laughs> and I refuse to use them. But I think it's you're easily misinterpreted. But again, it's like if you don't lower yourself into this like infantile way of communicating, you're going to be seen as hostile. And so the whole culture is being dominated by this like very this, this sort of girlishness, this this enforced girlishness. Even I have got. I was having. I had this this landlord, a very nice guy who's a, a geologist, and he was just texting me in a normal way, sans emojis, just with a normal period. And uh, even I was like, I think he's mad at us. <laughs> I think we did something wrong. <laughs> but if you period. don't have a period at the end of the sentence, that's less hostile. It's very weird. Uh, yeah, I, it's funny now that when Google or whatever service that you use recommends, you know, gives you options for how to respond. The options <laughs> fold in, you know, the smiley faces and the, uh, oh. the the exclamation points that you need. So it involves, you know, less thinking. I don't know where this this treadmill is going to go. But yeah, women women are more neurotic than men. I mean, it's uh, it's also a, a, a good characteristic, right? <laughs> to care about people's feelings. I'm yes. probably, uh, you know, I'm, I'm a fine mother in a, in a modern society, like, you know, with where there's very few things that could eat my baby or whatever, but I could be more neurotic. Even I remember looking at lots of pregnancy and mom forums and realizing that I was experiencing maybe, maybe 10% as much anxiety or, or worry or rumination as, as other women were. And worry and rumination, you know, evolution doesn't care how happy you are. Evolution cares about how many healthy babies with all 10 fingers and 10 toes you put out of the world, right? Um, and I remember the third time my child fell off the edge of my bed and hit her head. And my husband is like, what are you doing? And I was like, well, she will eventually learn not to get uh-huh. to the edge. And that'll happen eventually. She's very bouncy. She's got a very rubbery skull. But I did I, none of those times that I intend for her to fall over. But I, I just... Uh, Certainly, don't ruminate about her falling off the edge of the bed as as much as somebody else might, whose kid never falls off the edge of the bed. So, d- neuroticism is very useful, especially if you have uh, small humans that have very soft little parts that you need to protect. And it's absolutely something that seeps into every 
aspect of our society. So, you know, the same way it, to, to privilege a neurotic perspective as reality is, I think, a mistake mm. because you want to support women. Uh, but it is a, a very common perspective on reality is the neurotic perspective on reality. Like, you know, th- this person is saying that women don't exist or trans people don't exist or this small county in Ohio banning this book means that it's literally a slide into Nazism right. or whatever. Right. It's literally the handmaid's tale yeah. because oh, yeah. there are certain bills in certain states. Yes. So, okay. Yeah. There's a lot here. I want to know if you think that the culture as a whole is becoming more feminized, more neuroticized because of the way we communicate, because of the nature of work itself. There's a lot of discussion now about how traditionally male jobs are being phased out. So we have boys, you know, school is more, being able to sit still is higher valued than it used to be. So we've got boys being medicated because they can't sit still. Like as Adam Carolla says, <laughs> in the, you know, in 50 years we'll all be chicks. And I think that was the name <laughs> of a book he published 10 years ago. So uh I, I think it's kind of true. I I think I think he's on to something. Mm. I don't know. I was commenting on so there's this um I don't know this this controversy right now about um artificial intelligence and there's this guy called uh, well, not a guy anymore, now a non-binary person called Emily Torres and Timnit Gebru, and they write these op-eds about how artificial general intelligence discourse is, is run by uh, white educated men, eugenicists or whatever the case may be. Um, and I've read, I've read a lot of these pieces that they've written, and they, they're entirely meant to persuade other women about their their point. I don't think that they'd be persuasive to actual men in, in power. So there is this kind of like schools and daycares and reproductive policy, things where women run shit that are definitely being uh, very much changed by the feminine perspective uh, where, you know, kind of dispassionate cost-benefit analysis or even the idea that you should suspend your emotional views on things, you know, DEI, all that stuff, very much run by a, by a feminine perspective. A lot of other stuff, uh, politics, economics, financial markets, even things like, you know, <laughs> some forms of medicine, are still very male male dominated, and there there could be some lip service paid to a feminine perspective on such things. But you know, if you were to write an op ed about, I don't know, in terms of like when I read these artificial general intelligence screeds, things about algorithmic bias and stuff like that. I don't see somebody like Elon Musk or uh, Jeffrey Hinton or, or, or any of the other uh, usually white or Asian men who are high status in these areas being touched by this perspective at all. And w- women or a feminine perspective don't have, don't have powers in these realms. So there's, I think, more of a, a push and pull from a feminine and masculine perspective. Richard Hanania, I think, has come up with a catchy uh, term for this, which is like women's tears. And uh, I think I, I tweeted a while back, there's this book by Dan Dennett called Darwin's Dangerous Idea. And he talks about Darwin's uh, theory of evolution as a universal acid, which is this like sci-fi substance that goes through everything. You can't put it in a container because it goes through. It's a universal acid. It, it like corrodes everything. And I made this joke that women's tears are like universal acid. Like they, they, go, they go through everything. They corrode everything. Because it, it is really difficult almost impossible for for a woman to make a complaint about a specific organization or about how she's felt in a you know at a at a conference or uh, among people that she doesn't know effective altruism has had some uh, difficulty with this as well a woman can't say like oh i went to this conference and i felt uh, really excluded and i i felt sexually harassed or i felt whatever microaggressions or you know any any number of of bad ways that she could feel in the in that context it's not possible to say like, no, A, we don't care <laughs> or, um, or your feelings are invalid or whatever. The, the, those kind, that kind of rhetoric has become really heated. I'm thinking of James Damore, the Google engineer who famously wrote the Google memo 
about, you know, why there aren't more women coders. There were all these initiatives within Google, and this is true, and all the tech companies and basically any, you know, the, the efforts to get women into STEM and hard sciences have been going on in a pretty organized way for the last couple of decades, and we're still seeing pipeline issues. We still do not have nearly as many women in software engineering and coding, for example, as men. And there's a whole bunch of reasons for this. So James Damore, this very Asperger's engineer at Google, you know, was tired of these DEI initiatives that were, you know, in his view, sort of artificially trying to sort of reverse engineer the culture so that there could be more women in these roles. And he was saying, hey, it's really... It's, it's not necessary. And in fact, if you do want more women in coding, there's other things you can do. Instead of trying to artificially create this even playing field, let's, let's rethink this. Now, he didn't say it in quite those words. Uh, it was a pretty clumsy memo. But he used the word neuroticism as a way of describing a, a trait that is more common in women. And of course, that set everybody off because it was interpreted as, oh, he's saying women are a bunch of neurotic hysterics. And it was massively misinterpreted, this memo. And I have ruined dinner parties defending James Damore. <laughs> And I actually think that the memo is really polished and very good. I think that his yeah. his conclusion about how to get more women in STEM or in coding or whatever was a little bit clumsier, but he really, given his faculties, did the best he possibly could. He was imagining what it was like to be a, a neurotypical woman. That is a stretch for James Moore, mm-hmm. right? Yeah, A for effort there, though. Yeah. <laughs> so... Um, uh, Right. So, okay. So, but are we supposed to, I guess my question is like, how upset are we supposed to be about the fact that there are not as many women in these positions and how hard are we supposed to try to rectify that? And how many decades are going to go by before we just accept that "Mm, maybe women aren't going to do these jobs for various reasons and that's okay. The interesting thing about this dialogue about you know, women in STEM, or or if you want to talk about race or anything like that, is that talking about any kind of differences between people is considered to be the font, the foundation, the, the origin of these differences themselves. And so trying to solve the problem of women in STEM or women in coding or whatever must involve policing the speech of people who talk about inherent differences between men and women or inherent differences between ethnic groups, right? You can't say anything like that because if you do, you're actually bolstering the foundation of the prejudice, the discrimination, and the the way society is, is built in such a way. So it's really interesting that the solution has to undermine the dialogue itself I know exactly. And, uh, and so it's it's it's, it's sort of well, it's almost funny that you know if if you were to say something like that, you know there are these inherent differences then I could totally imagine cuz you know I I've I've had different views than I hold now at some various points in time and I could only imagine somebody saying you know if you posit that if you say that's true if you say that's an evidence based position then what you're doing is uh, bolstering the the reason for the disparity itself. Right. But like, what do you say to the people who say, okay, well, this is a chicken and egg thing. How can you say that women are less inclined to be software engineers, for example, when, you know, maybe there was some disinclination at one point, but that created a whole set of social conditions that made women less less likely to go into this. It's a boys club. They were, you know, discouraged by their female peers. They felt left out. They There was a different kind of uh, learning language in, you know, computer science classes that they weren't going to absorb as readily. Like, what do we, I don't know. Like, I do think that these things play off of each other. I don't think anything is, I don't think you can say, well, there are fewer women in hard sciences simply because they're not as interested full stop. I think they're not as interested and then a whole bunch of other things fall into place because of that. Hmm. But maybe it doesn't matter. I think, you know, one possible solution for this stuff will be just 
sort of the market and and pluralism, right? You know, if you have people on Twitter who are constantly posting pictures of uh, the board of some organization or a panel at a conference and saying like, you know, look at the sea of white and Asian male faces or whatever the case may be, and you can exert pressure on that group and they can either fold or not. Um, But if we have a bunch of different organizations, some which care about DEI and they implement Uh, these various different policies to try to increase representation and other groups that just don't and they don't care, then what we will eventually see is winning out in terms of, you know, efficiency and effectiveness of the groups that don't give a shit. And you're just going to see a a gradual uh, resistance or, you know, what you'll also see a lot of times is this kind of lip service paid, you know, that you have people that you have uh, front facing uh, to the public Mm -hmm. who represent whatever uh, women or other, or or other underrepresented minorities in any given um, group. And then that quells that, but it's, it's just, it's very easy to game uh, these concerns. And that's what you see all the time now. You know, if, if women were really better or as good at, at, as men at these various things and they were being underpaid, I'm not the first person to say this, but the market would really reward people who are willing to pay women at their reduced rate for this. Yeah, exactly. Every yeah. it would be all women employees at every corporation. Yeah, and I, I worked uh, in an effective altruism space on a on a. I was in a consultant for this organization uh, where this woman, you know, tried to write what she thought was the DEI case, you know, and collected all the literature showing that ethnic diversity was great on teams. And it was pretty weak, honestly, this this idea that having a diversity of, of people. I think that there are exceptions to this. Like if you live somewhere like New York City or Los Angeles or San Francisco, then the people that you meet, uh, women, men, and you know, like if you if you meet a woman in coding school, she's not representative of the average woman. And if you meet um, some a black man from Missouri, you know, at a startup in San Francisco, he's not representative of the average black man from Missouri, right? And so, what what happens is people who are living in these big cities that are magnets for the you know the highest intelligence, most conscientious, and most ambitious people in our country, they are getting a very different view of what the average person is like of, you know, various groups, ethnic groups and otherwise, you know, the average Indian immigrant is not like the average person Mm -hmm. who lives in India. Right. And so, uh, you can, I'm sure assemble a diverse group of people who've all run through this filter of being able to afford an apartment in San Francisco. And that could be a very powerful, uh, group of people with very complementary skills and viewpoints, uh, but it's not going to work outside that filter. Hmm. I want to talk about the way women police other women online and also sort of go through the motions of supporting other women when they're doing something else. So you had a piece in in Pirate Wires recently called Why Do Women Online Blow Relationship Issues Out of Proportion? I did not title that, by the way. Yeah, I know. We, I, I don't even know why I say the titles when, of things when I talk to authors because, yeah, no, we never are responsible for the titles, but it's just kind of a way of su- summing it up. So, yeah, you 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 pinpoint uh, something that I've that I've seen a lot. There's a kind of you. This is sort of like a you go girlism on steroids <laughs> that it seems to be permeating uh, a lot of the online discourse, and I don't think it's very productive. Yeah. Yeah, we've been talking a lot about women's neuroticism. And so certainly I've been, you know, I I got pregnant and then I joined this thing. It's called a bumper group. It's like all women who are having kids in the same month. And a lot of them are first-time moms. Um, There were a couple of women who were very refreshing on the site who had like six kids. And, um, you know, there'd be a woman on there who's like, I haven't felt my baby kick in two hours. I'm on my way to the hospital. (laughs) whatever. And, uh, and the woman with six kids is like, you know, call me, (laughs) call me when you're, when you're trying to give all your kids crackers in the back of the car while you're driving one of the hospital whose, uh, whose finger is dangling by a thread or whatever. Um, but, uh, in any case, it is very much, yeah, support for, uh, this very neurotic, very 
eggshell, easily harmed uh, kind of kind of viewpoint. And I was you know curious why why women sort of do that to each other, and it really comes down to how female friendships are are very different than than male friendships. So you know one example is a woman who is annoyed with her husband because he offers to do whatever she wants around the house on his day off. And she thinks that he should know uh, what should be done uh, rather than asking her uh, to do the what's called mental labor. Mm-hmm. Yeah, of, don't make of, her do of, the emotional uh, yeah. labor. And of, don't, of it's not this. her job to educate him. That's right. And, you know, it makes sense. If you ask any woman, this... <laughs> As a, as a sort of a aside, uh, there's this idea that people who are on the spectrum, Asperger's or autism, I'm not on the spectrum, but people who are on the spectrum make very good psychologists because something that would be obvious to everyone else, like why are women offering unconditionally supportive advice to each other online? That's such an obvious thing to the average person that they would never consider investigating it. But somebody on the spectrum would wonder about you know, why that is. Uh, because it's not it's not necessarily obvious to them. And as I said, I'm not on the spectrum, but I'm very um, I'm not typically feminine in my psycholo- you know in my psychology. And so it was curious to me uh, why nobody wanted my take that they were overreacting. <laughs> why does nobody want my your overreacting chill out uh, take? And so that piece was very much about a women trying to be, Supportive of each other's neuroticism, supporting the, the the worldview and the cognitive biases that led to potentially catastrophizing or having very bad attitudes, uh, not conducive to mental health. But also, you do see women sniping at each other in such places. So I think I didn't put this in the piece, but a few months ago, when the elections were happening, there was a, a post on the bumper group that said, you know, vote today and vote the right way, you know, vote entirely progressive. <laughs> and everybody knows what that means. Yeah. Vote the right way. <laughs> yeah. And um, I wrote a comment that said, I don't think that we're all going to get along as well if we're labeling each other as, you know, progressive or, or conservative. I think that if we uh, introduce politics into this group, you know, if somebody's like, hey, does anybody have like a formula recommendation? And I remember like a month ago, I argued with that person about, you know, whether Donald Trump uh, was a rapist, <laughs> you know, it's not going to really be very conducive to me being uh, considerate uh, about about what's going on with them. Uh, anyway, I did get flamed a bit. And there were some comments like, "This, you know, th- th- these people are questioning my right to exist, <sighs> or whatever, that kind of thing, uh, which is an incredibly... Uh, I think neurotic uh, worldview, but that's just and manipulative. I, the the whole questioning my right to exist thing, I can't even give that the benefit of the doubt and say it's neurotic. It's just blatantly m- manipulative and and weaponizing. I think, yeah, I don't, I haven't really been in person with people who've espoused that view very much, but it's difficult for me to believe that somebody would say that without feeling it. Yeah, uh, to I some guess. extent. I guess. You know, certainly there's a there's a cynical interpretation that maybe everybody who's upvoting that person is just doesn't it but feel But I mean that they're saying way? my feelings aren't valid. It's just that the language has there's such like concept creep. Like what you're saying is, oh, you're not respecting my feelings or you are denying that I really feel this way. That's different than you're questioning my right to exist. Somehow not respecting somebody's feelings has translated into You want me to die. <laughs> <laughs> not having, not recognizing their existence. So we are our feelings. Basically, what they're saying is my existence equals my feelings. Yeah, or the, yeah, the, the word like genocide and and like eugenics. And yeah, stuff like it's thrown around yeah. a lot. You know, the questioning my right to exist thing. Yeah, I mean, I feel I it, deep in this conversation now. I feel like there's some kind of anti-feminist thing going on. It is, I guess, it's possible. I've been listening to. I, I don't really like Angela Cini, but she wrote a book called The Patriarchs. Uh, where she, and I've been listening to a couple of interviews with her because apparently she goes in depth into how various different matriarchies function. And I am really curious about how matriarchies function because to me, more masculine values, things like suppressing your emotional response to something in order to consider something rationally Mm -hmm. or considering how some act influences the average person rather than the most vulnerable person, right? These are kind of utilitarian ways of thinking and I'm a utilitarian. To me, these things work better in aggregate than what I would consider 
a more feminine way of doing cost-benefit analysis, which is to say not doing cost-benefit analysis, but considering, you know, I, I think that uh, the idea of, of having everybody mask forever, that I think is a protect the most vulnerable at all costs f- sort of feminine uh, perspective that I disagree with. Well, it's also irrational. I mean, there's no evidence. So it's... Well, yeah. I mean, yeah, the, the, the feeling, masking thing... It's a feeling maybe, that this is the right thing to do. Yeah. You, you, there, there's a, a Dawkins passage about uh, cost-benefit in evolution. And, you know, we don't all drive around in tanks, for example, right? Because they're, they're not very... They're uh, very hard to parallel park. Gas women can't do. It. Women are bad yeah, exactly, at parallel parking. Exactly. Also. Um, yeah. So you know we have to make these these kinds of cost benefit analyses. And whatever thirty five thousand people die on our roads every year, if we all drove tanks, that wouldn't happen. But there are there are trade offs, and and people are certainly uh, not interested in talking about these trade offs. Nobody would say, oh, I think whatever ten thousand children going to school uh, is worth a hundred people dying. Nobody wants to say, to talk about that calculus overtly. And certainly in politics, it doesn't make sense to talk about such things overtly because it just, you know, it just upsets people. Although I'd love to live in a world where you could say something like that. But, uh, <laughs> that's called the podcasting world. So we, we say <laughs> stuff like that all the time. Uh, yeah. But yeah, so I am interested in, in how matriarchies function. And, and I think somebody like Angela Saini would say there are not core fundamental psychological differences between men and women in something like the big five, which are the, the five main personality traits that we that we talk about. Um, but I am interested in how you would govern a society for the benefit of everybody with some of these different uh, values. And there are masculine values that I think are bad. Like, I don't think that we would, some people would disagree with me here, but Let's say, you know, I said earlier that toxic masculinity was psychopathy. We don't elevate a psychopath's view of morality (laughs) any more than we should elevate uh, the borderline personality disorder or the extreme neuroticism view of of morality or cost-benefit analyses. I think that we should, you know, devalue both the most extreme feminized way of looking at the world and the most extreme masculinized way of looking at the world. Although some people would say utilitarianism is psychopathy, so. Oh, right. Something that (laughs) Sarah Hayter and I talk about a lot on my other podcast, A Special Place in Hell, is this question of whether women control cancel culture. Because it seems like nine times out of 10, if somebody gets quote unquote canceled, it's because somebody has raised a complaint and that person, I mean, correct me if you see this differently, but it seems like it's very frequently a woman. And the piling on on social media I feel like it's a lot of women. Occasionally, you've got some virtue signaling men, but I kind of feel like a lot of men, it's just, they they don't participate because it's like beneath them. Like it's a girly thing to do. It's not a, it's not like a self-respecting masculine thing to do. Do I, am I um, off about this? You're not off about that. Yes, cancel culture does seem really feminine. Um, this friend of mine, Justin Murphy, said something incredibly controversial. It was a couple years ago, I think, where he's like, <laughs> It's not manly or it's not dignified to care at all what women think. We shouldn't care about cancel culture because yeah. it's a woman's it's a woman's realm, and we should totally adore it. Um, I thought that was quite funny. But, I think he's onto uh, something. Yeah. I think I don't. I think that there's a kernel of truth there. Yeah, I mean, because it's very, it's just gossipy, it's petty, it's operating from a place of vulnerability, which I think a lot of men are allergic to. Yeah, and they they don't necessarily they don't necessarily get it. I think yeah, I think gossip is fun. I really liked uh, you know I really like Jesse and and Katie's blocked and reported. Blocked and reported is gossip on a you know kind but of. But it's writ analysis. Large. See, this is I wanted to ask you about this too because I know you have you've written about like the difference between gossip and sort of analyzing your your friends, and I think that talking about your friends. In, a, in an observational sort of anthropological way is fine. Although I certainly don't want to think about people talking about me that way. <laughs> That's different from like gossip, which is saying, you know, classified information about people, like really like spilling the beans on people's personal lives. And that's very toxic to me. And I, I see those as distinct. Um, to go back to kind of, you know, borderline personality disorder, Borderline personality disorder 
if somebody demonstrates disloyalty to you and you're with somebody, you know, you have a friend who's got borderline personality disorder, they can be extremely punitive and not just punitive, but like threaten to like cut you off or cut you out of their lives, uh, you know, completely. Uh, so if somebody, like I had a borderline personality disorder friend and she uh, complained about how her dad d- didn't want to fix her car or something. And I just was like, you know, that seems like a small transgression. And I think she didn't talk to me for a week after I said that. Uh, and so, yeah, it seems to me like cancel culture is the sort of sociological form of of borderline personality disorder. So with borderline personality disorder, you're looking for cues from somebody else that they really highly value you and that they're that they're loyal to you. Um, one interesting thing that I see, you know, in myself is like, let's say the other day, my husband, I wanted him to do something small for me. I'm super pregnant. So I kind of expect him to, you know, when I say jump for him to say how high, I know that's not reasonable, but that's what I want. And I wanted him to roll down the windows and he's got like misophonia. So he doesn't like the sound of the air. So he did eventually relent and roll down the windows. In the car. In the car. He likes, he prefers the AC because it's quieter. I prefer the windows rolled down. I'm the same way. Is that misophonia? Yep. That's funny because I hate having the windows open, but I think it is a sound, it's an auditory thing. Interesting. Yep, it's misophonia. So he did it eventually, but he didn't do it fast enough for my liking. And I was like really stewing about this. And I realized I was stewing about it because it was a cue, you know, to my evolved psychology that this man was being disloyal to me. And I'm like, you know, currently feeling his his parasitic organism in me wriggling around, <laughs> which is I'm really, really pregnant and I'm overly hot. And uh, that's also a thing that you see with like online apologies, right? Is like somebody apologizes 30 hours after the initial accusation was made against them. And that apology is picked apart and it's never adequate because somebody who engages in the transgression that they're accused of to begin with is somebody who is disloyal the apology would have to just be unbelievable, you know, to actually work. So it is, it's, you know, this picking apart of like, how long did it take for the person to make an apology? What was the words that they used to make the apology? Did they specifically say, I did X, Y, Z wrong? All this picking apart is very reminiscent of how you see somebody interact with somebody in a relationship with borderline personality disorder. And I'm talking about myself here, you know, having this, um, this reaction to my husband not capitulating fast enough, because I think borderline personality, just like autism, is a spectrum. And every every woman especially has a little bit of borderline personality disorder. Everybody feels this a bit, you know, in the way that they react to other people. Um, for me to be upset about somebody not capitulating fast enough is something that's f- reminiscent of, of borderline. And uh, I do need to spell all this stuff out because cancel culture is very much, it has all these different characteristics writ large. I think I, t- I posted about this a while ago. I went to go see this guy do a sex education seminar. His name's Reed Malko. And I don't know, 2017, 2016, several years ago, he asked a porn star to give him a hand job in a car. And he was really whiny about it and he pressured her a lot. And he got me too. I always that. go, being whiny is a great seduction technique. Well, she relented and <laughs> she relented and honestly, gave him a hand job. Yeah, mean, it worked. Well, right? <laughs> was he going to pay or it was, was just a, it was a voluntary? No, it was just like, a, he was just, he's, just like, he's, like a, he's like a big advocate of, of polyamory. And so I noticed that when I went to the seminar of his, he had this like pamphlet he handed out uh, about what his transgression was and what he had done. And he had a, what's it's called an accountability pod where he had a group of people who were evaluating his penance, you know, the the acts that he was engaging in, the apologies that he was giving people uh, for sincerity. And they were, you know, they were evaluating how well he was, quote. Like they were rating it? They were, they were. No, they were, they were like, they were telling him what he needed to do to make amends. Oh, they were workshopping it. Okay. Yeah. And I think, I don't know how long it took for him to make amends for this hand job. Um, (laughs) I don't know, a year, 14 months, something like that. Uh, so this was really interesting to me because he's actually been accepted back into this, um, sex education circuit, polyamory advocacy, you know, this very, very woke community. Uh, he's done enough and he's the only person I think I know of who's done enough and it's painful to see what he's done. Uh, but I didn't, you know, it it was an interesting end point to me, you know, on the, on the on the spectrum because I've actually never seen anybody forgiven by their community before. Really? No. 
Oh, wow. Wait, I want to think about that because it's true. You can only be canceled by your own side. I think this is another thing people don't understand. If you have a only cursory understanding of cancel culture, you know, people are likely to say, well, look, look what the, the political right is canceling the political left all the time. It's like, well, no, that's not the point. Like <laughs> getting canceled by the other side, you get points. There are people who haven't been forgiven, but like right. enough people have forgotten about it. They're like, whatever. Like with yeah. you know, Louis C.K., I don't think that he's really canceled anymore. And and I don't think people – like a lot of people who are pretending to give a shit don't give a shit anymore, right? But certainly the people who were calling for his head are not satisfied by his – I don't know if he even apologized. Right? And there are a lot of people, right? I mean, this is another another conversation, but the, there are a lot of people th- who are canceled who we, we we can't name them because they're canceled. Louis C.K., famous people who we can still remember and talk about are oh, not okay, really yeah. a prime example. Like there's all the people who've been disappeared. But, but anyway, I want to talk about polyamory just for at least a little bit here because you've been very vocal about this. Your, your husband, Jeffrey Miller, who's a also evolutionary psychologist, are you practice polyamory. At the same time, you're referring to uh, the polyamorous community as a very woke community. That is certainly my impression. Uh, and you also, what's that? They're the worst. <laughs> yeah, they are the worst. Sorry. I don't mean to be, no offense, but it's just, I don't, I don't get it. So, so, and you also have your book, it's called How to Train Your Boyfriend. So I feel like these two things are a little bit at odds. There's How to Train Your Boyfriend and also how to let your boyfriend go have sex with other other people while you're, you know, going to the spa or something. So <laughs> h- how does that work? Well, that would be ideal. <laughs> yeah. Um, uh, p- people who think that we're like really actively practicing at the moment really overestimate how much time and space and sleep. Well, you're very <laughs> pregnant at, at the moment. So that would be a whole um, other subset. Of, yeah. yeah. So you know, the, the, the basic idea is that Dan Savage talked about monogamish, and I like the word polyamory because it implies that there are other people that I love and that I'm allowed to love, uh, that I've had relationships with. If you look at you know, the average monogamous uh, relationship, sometimes there's even conflict, or often there's even conflict about keeping contact with people that you've ever had sex with or that you've ever uh, had romantic feelings for. And in some ways, you have to cordon off or quarantine uh, people in your life that you've had experiences with before uh, because of jealousy. So for me, uh, polyamory, which is, you know, really just the allowing, you know, not even if you're not practicing, it's the basic attitude that you are allowed to have romantic and sexual connections with other people uh, if you so choose. That's to me polyamory. Whereas I think many people use it in a more radical sense where it's, you know, only people who are actively having relationships with multiple other people. I even know, you know, I've seen polyamorous people online uh, who always seem to be trying to be in love with as many people as possible. Uh, The harder you try, uh, it's all about (laughs) how hard you try. Or, you know, or having even, you know, children with multiple people, which is also a very tricky act to uh, pull off. So I have talked about this. I've also said recently that I don't talk about it very much anymore publicly or advocate for it. I think I made a joke, it was like a, f- a couple years ago, that my husband was doing a much better job cleaning the house uh, for a, a, a woman coming over that he was romantically interested in. So that he was doing a great job cleaning the house. It was just supposed to be a joke. Like, you'll never see the house as clean as like, you know, yeah. when, when your husband's your girlfriend is coming over to visit. <laughs> and the backlash of this, w- you know, which was just a little twee observation. Right. Uh, <laughs> this like notoriously anti-Semitic account. Well, he's not anti-Semitic. All of his followers are. Zero HP Lovecraft or whatever his name was wrote some kind of really disgusting quote tweet like, what's what's a radical idea? Don't let your wife have other men's cum in her or something disgusting like that. And then I got all kinds of, I've never gotten so much racial abuse as I did in that, in that 48 hours. So many people saying I should be gassed in DMs and, uh, and publicly. It was really unbelievable. Uh, so yeah, there's no reason for me to talk about it anymore. Even people who are pretty reliably sympathetic think that if I advocate it, I'm somehow contributing to the decline of the of the nuclear family. Or like black women are having multiple baby daddies because of what Diana Fleischman told them. Right. Polyamory. Well, see, this is the thing. Okay. So how do you separate polyamory from just like a normal, like a person in the world who's dating and like sleeping with a lot of people? 
Not you, but how does one, the polyamory community? The poly community has values that I, I don't hold. I just like the term and I consider myself uh, polyamorous. But it's about being honest, about having an interest in other people. It's about being open to outside romantic and sexual contact. And it's about, yeah, being completely transparent. Uh, you know, hookup culture or even what modern dating looks like, you know, where um, you know, Louise Perry talks about this a lot too, where you're in like a situationship where you're dating somebody, but you're both too agreeable or too afraid to actually talk about who else you might be having sex with. And so both people develop expectations that are discordant and then they both end up feeling terrible about things, right? See, I used to call that an expectationship. Yeah, that's 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 a perfectly that's a very good term as well, but in those kinds of scenarios one solution would be don't have sex until marriage and strategize or or um, a negotiate a very explicit committed agreement as soon as possible. Another possibility is just you just tell people who else you're seeing and you deal with the feelings that come up and you talk about what your expectations are. And and it is true, and this is another thing that gets me and, and, and my husband in trouble, is that if you look at how we make social rules, social rules are not made for people who have you know, the highest conscientiousness, highest self-control, and highest like self-awareness of the population. They're made for the, the average uh, person, right? You know, that's why we tell people not to smoke meth. I'm sure there are people who can't smoke meth without any kind of ill effect, uh, but some people will smoke meth and it will ruin their lives. And uh, maybe I'm equating polyamory <laughs> to meth, meth here. Like, you know, a sophisticated <laughs> yeah. party where there's like jazz playing and it's nice and you have a glass of wine and you smoke meth. It's a totally different <laughs> picture. <laughs> but yeah, so I talk about Rob Henderson's idea about luxury beliefs here because it is, it, you know, it is a lux it's a luxury belief, the idea that you could have outside sexual contact without blowing up your life. And it's a luxury belief because it's not available to everybody. So if I say you have to have X, Y, Z characteristics to make this work, people call me a stupid elitist bitch. <laughs> and if I say everybody should try this, people say you're blowing up people's lives and you're advocating something irresponsibly. Well, what are the characteristics that you need to make it work? I think that I, I'm not, I, I didn't start off especially low in jealousy, but there are people who just don't experience jealousy. That's very helpful. Not being a, a especially jealous person. It's helpful to be in a relationship with somebody especially if you're like if you're not having kids or you don't share a lot of uh, you know financially stuff obviously that makes it higher stakes you can do it if you have kids and if you have shared finances um if you have uh, good self control uh right uh, i I've, I've met this polyamorous couple i use that word loosely and they were not incredibly you know self controlled and they were both were doing reckless things with other people um were really that was really bad for their uh relationship you know being smart and also not being so agreeable that you can't have a difficult conversation, right? If you're so agreeable or if you're so afraid of conflict that you can't say, I actually fall in love with somebody else, then you are going to have difficulty uh, doing the polyamory thing. So it involves a lot of unusual uh, characteristics. A lot of young people are trying non-monogamy and I think something, it's like, it's more common than being LGBT as being non-monogamous. Yeah. But if I was to say, well, A, polyamorous community is very against, bristles at the mere mention that there's a right way or a wrong way to do anything, that there are some things that work better for most people than other things, right? You look at something like relationship anarchy, doesn't work well for most people. Still something that's common. What's relationship tested. anarchy? It's like not having any kind of hierarchy uh, with your relationships, letting them develop as they will and, and not labeling them or putting expectations oh, so on them. So that's like college. Yeah, that's like <laughs> what a lot of people do. <laughs> it's called freshman yes, year of college. Like, and you realize that yeah. this is yeah. possible. Yes, yeah, and so like, the, the, when I've talked about, you know, when I've talked about dating other people or seeing other people or being romantically involved with other people with my husband and saying things like, we are hierarchical. We are more important to each other than any other uh, other people. And... You know, if you I would talk to a hardcore polyamorous person, they'll say that we're discounting 
degrading or treating other people as as like mere objects. If you look at the discourse around something like I'm really I'm really ranting now. <laughs> something like unicorn hunting, right? This is idea that straight people go around looking for women to have threesomes with. And that when they do that, they're, you know, using these women as mere objects and wait, unicorn wait, hunters. Wait, 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 wait. Who's the unicorn in this? I don't I'm not familiar. Unicorn with is the th- is the is the woman. Usually it's a woman, right? So usually a heterosexual couple, they get together and they seek out a woman to have a threesome with. That's called unicorn hunting. Right. Because she's so, because this is so hard to find or because this is like a Because third she's hard thing. to find and because okay. she's magical and it's a, it's a nice see. term. Okay. I think it's a nice term anyway. A unicorn. Okay. I mean, it, the unicorn thing is also associated with the new gender movement, but okay. This, this I didn't know that. Effort. Yeah. You know, a, 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 a man who has a threesome with a, heter- a committed heterosexual couple can also be considered a unicorn. But there's all this like discourse around it like, oh, you know, they expect that woman to only sleep with them and not sleep with other people. They expect her to be like monogamous to the two of them. And the woman's often not fully bisexual and they're not going to love her. They're just using her for sex. And there's just all this like, really heated discourse. Like if you go to polyamory sites, like on Reddit or whatever, there's all this discourse about the, the disgusting, evil, heteronormative um, unicorn hunters. And are they more worried about women as unicorns than as men? Is this another example of sort of- It actually does seem that way. Yeah. I don't think, I mean, it, male unicorns seem very happy to be, <laughs> to be yeah, used okay. and then disposed of, yeah. right? They seem very happy to have some casual sex and not worry about what the what the repercussions of that will be. Um, it is even another way that there's a kind of, uh, you know, evolved uh, sex difference here in terms of how much- But also, expect. sorry, not to dwell on this, but wait, so are we talking about threesomes in particular? Because I would think there would be fewer men involved in threesomes, like with a two, with, where there would be two men and one woman. Like how, how common is that? Um. Certainly, there's a there's a <laughs> there's a professor called Todd Shackelford who analyzed pornography for the popularity of two men and one woman versus two women and one men. I think the most common fantasy that men say that they have is two women with them. But if you look at porn, allegedly, this is what Todd's paper came up with: the two men, one woman is more popular. He talks about that like in terms of like sperm competition, like men get turned on in contexts that emulate ancestral conditions where you would be both trying to impregnate the same woman. Wow, this has gone really And they would have to like fight each field. other. One of them finally dies and the then the other one fight. Sex with her. Yeah. <laughs> It's much, much nicer fighting than their typical beating each other up fighting. In any case, so, you know, for many people, this kind of thing, a heterosexual couple having sex with a woman is something that they like and everybody likes and everybody's having a good time. Um, but it's it's uh, it's denigrated because it's not like queer enough. If you also look at swingers. Okay, swingers are not polyamorous. They are usually heterosexual couples. They go out, they go to like a swingers club, they meet with another heterosexual couple and they swap. You know, this in terms of like a relationship technology, if you want to call it that, it's really good because if you're having sex with somebody new, you're very unlikely to feel jealous. And also there's like mutually assured destruction, right? The, the couples who swap off, if they're both married and they both have kids or whatever, oftentimes swingers are much more conservative. Uh, they are as a yeah, rule. Yeah, no, that's they like the cool. John Cheever mode. Yeah. Like I feel like it's all yeah. about like cocktails and uh, the suburbs. In, in terms of game theory, <laughs> right. it's like really beautiful, right? you like, n- nobody's going to run off with the other person's husband because they could, they could screw you up as, as easily as, as you could screw them up. It's, it's, as I said, mutually assured destruction. So it's a very stable strategy in terms of having outside sexual contact. Uh, but the long and the short of it is, you know, human beings didn't evolve to be monogamous. Oftentimes relationships break up. Um, to me, I think a monogamish relationship, I think, you know, that's what Dan Savage's word for it is, or what I call is like very light polyamory, where you have people that you love and that you have romantic feelings for, people that you're allowed to have outside contact with. You don't rely on your partner for everything sexually, romantically, and emotionally. And you're open about your joy and relationships with other people. I think that is in many ways more stable than a very rigid monogamous relationship where you're relying on somebody for all these things, which ends up often, especially if you're in a monogamous relationship where you're not allowed to talk to anybody you've ever had sex with before, which is incredibly common. Oh, gosh. Yeah. Super common. Really? But you also look at the average monogamous relationship, right? 30% of people have cheated at some point. 
So even the average monogamous relationship isn't really monogamous. Right. But it, we're just talking about shades of, of, of infidelity here. Okay. But would light polyamory include like having, you know, mm-hmm. outside relationship with somebody who you were very fond of and very close with, but not necessarily having sex with, or like how much is sex uh, required for it to qualify as polyamory? I don't think the sex is necessarily required. Um, uh, Scott Alexander has got a, a post called Polyamory is Boring, and he's asexual. Asexual. So, he's asexual. Yeah, he's asexual, yeah. So he talks about, and I know a few polyamorous asexual people who... Wait, is this the star, is this the star, the star, yeah. like, codex? The star codex, yeah, guy? that's right. He's asexual. Yeah. He's an asexual polyamorous. <laughs> okay, well, that... Makes it so, simpler, I guess. So asexuals, you know, I know a few people who are asexual and uh, they like polyamory because if you were in a monogamous relationship as an asexual with somebody who was not also asexual, then there would be an expectation that you would have to put out. But that's just be- called being asexual. friends with somebody. What? It's called being... No, 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 no. It, I don't, well, I, I don't Wait, know very much about being asexual. I don't understand, I don't understand this. No, the, I, you could have a romantic relationship with somebody that's okay. not sexual. Okay. I think there are romantic friendships too. Yes. I have many romantic yes. friendships, right? Yeah, for sure. But, uh, okay. But okay. That's, that's my sh- my spiel about polyamory is like, it makes people angry it, it, if I talk well, it about it. Confused. it makes them confused. It makes them confused and I think that makes them angry. Uh, and if I say, you know, give it a try, people think I'm blowing up people's lives. If I say, you need special characteristics to make it work, people think I'm an elitist. And so I'm not... You know, I'm not really interested in writing a book about it. Also, if I was to write a book about it or write a bunch about it, the polyamorous people who think that there's no right way to do things and that the queerer you make relationships, the better, would also come for me because I would be saying, you know, if you look at evolutionary psychology, there's a way to make this work that works better than other ways uh, that don't work as well. Like, I think that hierarchical uh, polyamory works much better than non-hierarchical polyamory. But that, you know, because polyamory is actually inherently political, because a lot of people who are polyamorous are actually t- trying to enact Marxism in their romantic lives, believe it or not. Yeah. That's also a, a tricky issue. So, yeah. So what's the core message of How to Train Your Boyfriend? How to Train Your Boyfriend is about how women especially are have evolved to use rewards and punishments on other people to change their behavior. So for women throughout evolutionary history, they had a very difficult problem, which was uh, getting a man to provide for them and to protect them and to help take care of their kids. Um, sometimes those kids you know, didn't, didn't necessarily belong to that man. And so women are intuitive uh, behaviorists. Now, part of being an intuitive behaviorist means that you're often reacting to behavior that you like or don't like before your conscious awareness. You're not consciously aware of a lot of the way you're, you're responding uh, to a man's behavior or to a child's behavior or to your, to your friend's behavior. So in How to Train Your Boyfriend, I really try to untangle what your immediate response is to various behaviors, like if your husband or boyfriend or whatever isn't listening to you when you talk or doesn't remember something that you said before. Hey, why does that bother us? Why do we want to punish that behavior? It's because it's an indicator of divestment. It's an indicator that he's not fully mentally here with us, and therefore it's a cue of potential uh, abandonment. So it's really kind of about managing your overreaction and then considering what behavior you do want and how to get what you want using you know behaviorist techniques, things like rewards and punishments uh, consistently. And a lot of, unfortunately, what I think our, you know, evolved psychology does is actually alienate people in relationships because uh, I think women are naturally quite punitive uh, towards men. So punishment has its place. I think punishment has its place. Um, a, a lot of behaviorists throughout history have said punishment never works. Punishment obviously works, but you have to know when to use it and, and when not to use it and when to use reward. So that's the kind of premise of how to train your boyfriend. It goes through a bunch of different Things that you might want, so things like, we just talked about jealousy, how to manage jealousy, how to manage arguments, how to manage attention, which is really important, how to manage, uh, you know, if he forgets things that you want him to remember, 
his his memory, how to get him to be more helpful to you. Like household labor has become a really hot topic in like the last 10 years. You know, what is it, what is it that women are doing to undermine men being more helpful? Well, I think part of part of what they do is micromanage to the point where there's no way he can do it right. You see this in childcare too a lot, right? So it's like, it's not enough that he cooks them dinner. It has to be a certain way. Like there are just, you know, there's a, there's a shorter psychic leash sort of, you know, like he's, it's, he's not going to, it's one thing if he takes them to school, but he's not going to take them to school and schmooze with the teacher or the other parents in the right way. Yeah. I found a really good paper about this when I was writing about it. Something like, a woman who micromanages ends up doing five hours of housework per week. A woman who doesn't micromanage ends up doing like two and change. There's a huge difference in uh, how much work men are willing to do uh, for a woman who micromanages versus a woman who doesn't micromanage. And you know, and where is that micromanagement coming from? Well, there are a huge number uh, of life or death decisions that women have made, you know, throughout evolutionary history with regard to their children's care. Yeah, uh, you know. Louise Perry had this interesting opening gambit for a, a, a speech that she gave at the National Conservative Conference where she was talking about cassava root and about how if you don't process it in this long and arduous way, that it ends up being poisonous. And uh, that, you know, colonialists or whatever tried to find uh, shortcuts around this and it didn't work. People end up being poisoned by it. And so, yeah, doing things in a very specific way has been something that's been um, important you know, throughout, throughout evolutionary history. And that is why women get attached to uh, doing things in a, in a specific way. You have to recognize that in order to undermine your own desire to, to micromanage. Well, I want to loop back to my opening question, but before we go to the, the bonus, and I think it's, uh, you know, it's very much connected to what we've been talking about. Like, what do you think of the dating economy and the mating economy? How does this bode for the future of human civilization? We hear about how young people are not having sex. We hear about how there's no um, eligible men, high value men, so to speak, for all these high achieving women. Where do you fall in this discussion? I don't really know that much about the dating market at the moment and the way that I've dated always always been very different than the way that other people dated. So I dated multiple people almost all the time. But how did you have time for anything? And you still got a PhD. Yeah, there's a big hole there's a big hole in my CV actually from one year. I think I dated like six people at the same time. Oh. There's you should like put that on your C V <laughs> I'm the sorry. References. They'd be your references. <laughs> So there was a very funny uh, comment on the Louise Perry uh, conversation where some, you know, this woman was like, easy for you to say as a woman who's gotten married and had children that, you know, slutting around is fine. And this uh, this comment underneath it said, she rode the cock carousel to victory. Because mm. <laughs> I mean, have you ever heard of cock carousel? Have you heard that? I have not, but I like it. It's alliterative, <laughs> if nothing it's else. Liter- so the cock carousel is this idea that, yeah, women have a ton of sex and before they settle down, the cock carousel. Um, I don't really know. Um, I, I think that perhaps because people spend so much time online, they've become very uncomfortable having conversations about their explicit expectations. Maybe because men and women are not comfortable with, I think if if men and women knew about evolutionary psychology more, women would say, you know, actually I thought that I was happy to have casual sex, but I'm actually not happy to have casual sex and that's Okay. I think demisexuality is a sort of stopgap here. And I think, you know, I think demisexuality is... Explain what it means. Explain what it means. Demisexual is somebody who is only attracted to someone that they have an emotional connection with. So like a girl. AKA that would be women. Typical <laughs> feminine sexuality. That's right. So, you know, to me, it's all pretty alien uh, because I'm 42. And uh, when I was in my 20s, I think I briefly tried to do the hookup thing and I didn't like it. And I guess I didn't feel any, I have a conversation with Ayla coming out where she doesn't actually think that there's any pressure for young women to have hookup sex. And because she's very disagreeable and I'm very disagreeable, I think it can be difficult for us to understand what subtle social pressure does the average agreeable woman. I think this is the problem with 
people like you and me and and Ayla. So Ayla actually was just a guest on um, a Special Place in Hell, my podcast with Sarah Hader. So some listeners may have heard her there. But yeah, like we are by definition outliers. The fact that we're thinking about this stuff in the way that we do makes us not the norm. So I think we have to decouple our own experiences and feelings from what maybe most people experience. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I do have to do that. And I have to sort of channel, you know, what, how I would feel at my most vulnerable, my most sensitive and my most starry eyed in love with some young man in order to figure out, okay, would I, you know, would I just keep having casual sex with somebody that I didn't find especially fulfilling and that wasn't going anywhere that I, that I wanted it to go. So I do think that, you know, as much as evolutionary psychology is maligned, I, I do think that if young women had more of an idea about what these what these average sex differences looked like, um, yeah, there's this stuff about how young people aren't having enough sex and how there aren't enough high value men. Certainly, it seems like there's a huge, you know, Chris Williamson, Jordan Peterson, Andrew Huberman, Lex Friedman, Joe Brogan, all these men who are trying to cast a light for young men about how to manage themselves and how to be more productive and how to be higher value. Um, I'm not sure if any of that, how, how much any of that works. So I'm not particularly worried. If you look at the data, um, it's not as alarming as certainly anecdotes are. Uh, but I do think that if people were just, you know, less agreeable and more forthright, uh, it could help people have more fulfilling relationships. Uh, and, there does seem to be this neo trad movement, which I don't agree with a lot of it, but I do like it when I see a movement that is countercultural and that might lead people to make a compromise between having sex with a new person every night and thinking about getting married and having kids. Mm-hmm. All right. Well, I was going to ask you how hopeful you are about the future, but I guess the fact that you are are pregnant and already have one other baby would answer that question. And maybe we'll touch on some of that in, in the bonus, but are you hopeful? I mean, I'm assuming so. I guess I'm fairly hopeful. Civilization does seem to to march onward and upward. And honestly, I don't have the bandwidth uh, to worry about civilization because <laughs> I have a toddler. So maybe that's really quite a wide lane. Cure. Yes, that's true. <laughs> the cure for that particular problem. Okay, fair enough. Well, Diana, this has been fascinating. Thank you so much for talking with me. You're going to stay a little extra for the paying subscribers and talk about the thing we always talk about, which is how you feel about being the age that you are. So you can uh, expound on that. But in the meantime, uh, this has been great. When does How to Train Your Boyfriend come out? I just got an extension because I'm having another baby, but um, it's about 60% drafted. Uh, I do need to start putting out uh, bits and pieces of it, uh, but it probably won't be out until 2024 at the earliest. Okay. Well, that's that's right around the corner. So we'll be able to train our boyfriends soon enough. <laughs> well, uh, this has been great, Diana. Thank you so much. Thank you, Megan. That was the main part of my conversation with evolutionary psychologist Diana Fleischman. If you want to hear the bonus portion, and it gets really juicy, and I think you do want to hear it, and you are not yet a paying subscriber, go to megandaum.substack.com and become a paying subscriber that gets you access to bonus content every single week. I will mention very quickly that Diana will be at our Unspeak Easy retreat in Austin this coming weekend, June 24th and 25th. We never reveal the names of participants without their permission, but Diana has consented to my revealing this to you. Chances are that by the time you hear this, the retreat will be sold out. But if you're really determined and if you hurry, you can go to theunspeakeasy.com and request info and we'll see what's going on. Bridget Fetisi, famed YouTuber, podcaster, all around fascinating thought criminal person, is the featured guest speaker at that retreat. It's going to be a really special one. So I cannot wait. And I can't wait to tell you about it when I get back. Within reason, I can't tell you everything. Another really quick side note 
In the interview you just heard, Diana refers several times to conversations she's had with Louise Perry, who is the author of the book, The Case Against the Sexual Revolution, and who was a guest here last year. What Diana is referring to is her March 23rd guest appearance on Louise's podcast, Mother Maiden Matriarch, as well as Louise's May 6th appearance on the Aporia podcast, for which Diana often conducts interviews. So many podcasts, so little time to do whatever it was we did before. This is the Unspeakable Podcast. I will be back next week with another super nuanced guest. Thanks for listening. See you next time. Uh-huh.